Hi, William Sheriff. I'm the executive chairman of Encore Energy Corp. We're looking forward to being the next new producer of uranium in the United States with our quality team of uh, experienced in situ professionals leading the uh, green energy revolution in the States. Mr. Sheriff and Mr. Gorenson, thank you very much for joining us. Now, uh, now Bill, you're in, you're in Frankfurt, right? And, right. and Paul, you're, you're back home. Right. That's great. S -s -s Splitting, splitting the roles, pincer movements. Um, I want to talk. To, I want to talk about the big news of the day, obviously. And then, if you don't mind, I want to then also talk about what North American uranium nuclear is 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 doing and how do you guys take advantage of that. So, Bill, if, if you don't mind, Alta Mesa uh, acquisition from uh, Energy Fuels. Uh, why have you done it? Well, I, I tell you, it's uh, certainly an asset we're familiar with. It, it adds to our uh, Texas base of production. You know, our, our existing uh, two plants, there are 11 in the States. We had two already. This is a third. More than doubles our production capacity. It uh, brings in a substantial amount of production starting in 2024. Uh, so it really, really to us is, is accretive on a number of levels. You know, we've, we've done quite a bit of work in the M&A space and have a history of doing that. Uh, this, this was just a, the most natural uh, addition, as well as Paul's background. He actually built the plant originally. Uh, a number of years ago and, and successfully operated it during the peak of the last cycle. Uh, so it's, uh, it's something obviously, as I say, Paul's quite familiar with, the company's familiar with, fits right into our, our uh, you know, base of, base of operations in Texas. And really the, the, the accretionary uh, metrics of it are, are just compelling. You know, there's, we're dedicated to ISR in the U.S. There's not that many other options out there. Uh, this one just hit all the marks, uh, you know, it, it time to production, quantum of production, low cost production, uh, and, and uh, a bit of a boost on the NAV as well. So we're, we're quite happy with the, uh, with the transaction and I look forward to uh, getting going on the ground. Well, yeah, and, and obviously, um, Paul, uh, you've got a bit of history with this. You've also got a bit of history with energy fuels. Was it an easy uh, negotiations? I mean, they, they seem to be gravitating towards the rare earth part of their um, business. So d did that help conversations for you? I, it did. And, and I'll just put it this way. I think both companies see this as a win-win. Energy Fuels can take and, and uh, monetize an asset they have and, and use that to reinvest into their projects and priorities. But for us, as, as Bill mentioned, it brings about a, a really solid uh, production facility that has significant resources, low cost production history and uh, infrastructure it's already installed. So it really provides a boost for our production pipeline. We're already continuing in Texas in our on our Rosita project that's up and, and our other projects in South Texas, those are moving along also. So this will be an additive, uh, bring bring it out additive capacity and, and uh, production in the near term, uh, which is where we see the opportunity in the markets happening. Right, and, and what does that do for you? Because I'm, I'm looking at energy fuels, you know, the, the strap line was, you know, uh, the US is number one uranium producer, right? Obviously the move to, to rare is, is is something that they want to, want to do and that's for them to comment on. I don't expect you to talk about that one. But it, potentially one last bit of competition for you in the US market and the North American market more broadly. So it kind of solidifies uh, that position for you. Is, is there more to come? Yeah, we're always looking. Ahead, yeah, we're, we're always looking. Sorry, just kind of jumped in on that uh, in terms of the M&A. Uh, there are certain other assets, certain other companies, but uh, you know, like I say, it'll be hard hard pressed to match this one clicking, you know, checking all the boxes and, and, and being a creative. And, you know, the you know, Energy Fuels is still planning on being a significant uranium producer. They have the only conventional mill in the U.S. So, you know, this this pretty much uh, fit fit into our uh, backyard uh, better better than their portfolio and was, a, as Paul said, a win-win situation. So, well, we're always looking. You know, it's taken us about a year between our acquisitions. Uh, you know, this, this may be the crowning achievement in terms of acquisitions, but we're certainly always on the look. Right. Okay. And in terms of the market, the market, um, I just want to talk about market fundamentals at the moment, uh, and we can also come back to what you're going to do in terms of positioning yourself. So it's it's been a year of highs and lows for you guys for uranium uh, as the market's trying to sort of work out how it feels about um, what the utilities are going to do. Um, so. I, I don't know if you got a sort of sense of what 2023 is going to bring. I, I think uh, 2023 is going to bring uh, more uh, utility engagement in the market, and I, I say that because, uh, as as uh, we all know, the the whole fundamentals of the the uranium market has uh, overall globally has changed dramatically as a result of what's happening in 
in Eastern Europe right now and, and the repercussions of that. And so we're seeing a fundamental change and, and we're potential supply sources. But uh, by and large, we've talked to several utilities. I've talked to several utilities that uh, have said that they're refocusing back to, first of all, to secure supply chains, focusing on, on North American supply chains. And then on top of that, uh, there's because of, uh, of what's going on in Europe right now, the management or the, the, the shareholders of a lot of these utilities are really focusing on ESG. And uh, they're looking for, you know, uh, something that helps them meet their ESG um, criteria and getting your uranium from, from unstable, air, you know, governments, et cetera, or at least governments who aren't uh, considered kind of in that social responsibility area. Uh, really now is a kind of a measure uh, that they're gauging against. And so I get, you know, I've been, the when I met with the utilities, they, they say, well, we really have any openings until 2027. After they say that, and I'll say, that's great. Yeah, that, that fits perfectly for our plan. Uh, and then they'll come back and say, well, uh, if you've got any material in 2023 or maybe 24, 26, 5, uh, we, we'd really like to hear about that now. So, and I think it has to do with the fact that we're, we're seeing this in um, uh, several com utilities are actually flexing up their deliveries to get them in faster to secure supply. And um, and we're going to see, I think we're going to see more pressure on the spot market going into 2023 as the uh, enrichment and the conversion aspects of our fuel market uh, are beginning to become more settled and, and more, uh, more predictable uh, is a better term for it. So the, the, the enrichment and the conversion is becoming more predictable. What, what, what's happening in, in the West? Because obviously Russia is a big component of that, 40% 40, 40 of the market. Are people kind of working, at, working that side of things out? Because obviously uranium then has to, will follow suit. So what, what, do, what do you know? Well, they're, they're, they're working on supplying uh, conversion capacity, and that's principally going to be uh, from Orano. Uh, and of course, let's not forget Converdine is restarting this in 2023. Uh, and, and they're really not focusing on 23, 23 deliveries. They're focusing on 24, 25, 26 type of stuff. And, uh, and by getting more, having the conversion uh, become uh, more available, and there's even talk of even Springfields in the UK restarting and uh, to add capacity. And I don't know if that's going to happen, but uh, it, uh, it's being discussed as a means to um, fill this, this conversion gap that occurs right now. Because uh, the enrichers are moving towards underfeeding, uh, and underfeeding just means a higher tails assay, which, from a uranium supplier's perspective, provides more demand for uranium. And uh, and so, what what I'm seeing is is that uh, is that it's kind of lot, you know the utilities aren't in the market right now, and of course, where uh, the overall equity markets are, you, you don't have Sprott being as active as they were in the past. And so it's kind of languished around that fifty dollar mark, and uh, but I think uh, uh, going into twenty twenty three, we're going to see a lot more pull on the spot market, as now slots that would have been replaced by filled by Russian low enriched uranium is going to be filled with an, with new conversion enrichment and production. It's it's kind of interesting at the moment if you look at like it, so parallel to this at the moment, you know, the Russian sanctions on on oil, they they are now trying desperately to find a home for a million barrels a day because the you know the the, the chinese the indians and, and and others who've taken advantage of low prices are now maxed out in terms of storage so um looking at uranium market if sanctions continue long after the ukraine situation you know hopefully eventually resolves itself what does that do to the uranium market spot price contracts etc in terms of bifurcation or, or the way that uranium is priced around the world. And obviously, ESG is a, a, small, a small component of that. But how do you how do you see this thing playing out? And again, how do you feed into that? Well, the uh, I see right now it's not really becoming bifurcated. Clearly, you know, there's no two set prices, but we're seeing that right now is manifesting through the uh, the swaps, location swaps between various uh, conversion facilities, and. Um, but uh, there will become more bifurcation. A good example is of why that's the case is, is that let's talk about you know Kazakhstan and where they're, you know they've been talking about this Trans Caspian route, and uh, 
Uh, right now, it's limited to 3,000 tons per year. You know, they're going to be they're expecting to produce 50, 58,000 tons per year. Uh, and moving that much material, they can still go through St. Petersburg, but uh, they keep having some rail interruptions, is what I've heard. And uh, but you can see things like Kaz Kazatomprom just recently announced a supply agreement with the Chinese utilities, and then Cameco also announcing a uh, extension, you know, extension of their their Chinese contracts. And that's all material that's produced in Kazakhstan is going to go across the border into China, rather than uh, try to export out of the country uh, to through uh, Western ports. So what we're what I what I think we're going to see is that. Uh, uh, you're going to see more of a, a Central Asian uh, Russia kind of a, uh, a market, and the Russians will continue to run enrichment. Keep, let's not forget that uh, a, a large portion of the reactors operating in the world that aren't in Russia are Russian reactors and require Russian fuel. And um, even though we, we know that there's countries in Eastern Europe who are looking to convert to Western supplies, uh, that's that's only a very small portion of that. And so the my my uh, my my feeling is is that you're going to see more concentration and and excess Russian capacity is going to go to make it cheaper to buy Russian uranium for the Russian designs and also use that as a package deal for additional new Russian reactors. Well, okay. Well, it, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how that 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 all that all plays out. But let's let's get back to you, which is. You're in the U.S. You're in South Texas, South Dakota, Wyoming, New Mexico. Obviously, we've heard U.S. representatives from the Department of Energy talking at the NEI conference in in London. We've, um, you know, we've been through Section 232 and, and a number of catalysts in the last year where the U.S. government's talked talked a good game, but it now seems to be finally realizing that it does need to step up in terms of energy security. How do you, with, with you know, with your U.S. assets, take advantage of of, of that situation? Well, we take, we, the way we take advantage of it is actually uh, putting in, you know, we've got the production assets, putting it, making them available to the market. So that means what we did at Rosita, we, we, uh, uh, we, we refurbished the plant and we're putting in well fields now to start producing uranium. Uh, same thing with Alta Mesa when we, when we start there, it's going to be bringing this capacity back because right now, in the U.S., uh, I believe the last quarterly EIA report said it was like 3,000 pounds were produced in the uh, third quarter of uh, 2022, and uh, and that uh, is that means that nothing's happening. So we got to bring that capacity back, and by focusing on our lower cost properties right now, we're able to uh, uh, let get that supply put in, prepared to go into the market, and that will provide us. We want to be the, the place that the, uh, the fuel buyer at the, the utilities come to to look for reliable, but also near-term production and feed that they can, they can rely on and not on something that's going to take years to get put into production. So by building out this pipeline, we're able to do that while we're continuing to focus on our future properties in South Dakota and Wyoming. At the same time. I had an interesting conversation with a, another uranium CEO he's, he has produced in the past. Uh, he's kind of quite outspoken about what's actually happening in, in the market. He said there are people who will do and there will be people who talk about doing. Uh, I, those who will produce and those who've got no idea or no intention to produce, they, they've got another you know, business model, I, my, my, mining the market. Um, for you guys, obviously quite close on some of these um, assets in terms of production, and they're also previous pr uh, producers. What's the kind of picture that you're trying to paint for all of these utilities in terms of the, 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 the you've got to give them certainty around your ability to, to produce, to ensure that these negotiations, you get better terms, that you get bigger contracts um, as, as you kind of get back to or get into production. So what's the kind of picture you're trying to paint for them? Well, uh, first of all, experience and the fact that we've got a history of delivering, right? So whether it's uh, my history with the Alta Mesa project or my history with our, our other projects we have, or just in general and around the uh, industry, plus our, our base, or what I would like to call our technical bench strength, uh, we've got the, the means to be able to deliver. And we've got, we're demonstrating we can deliver uh, uh, as you know, as we promised. In other words, if we're gonna, if we're gonna, if we, the, that that's the main. What I've seen is the the strongest point any company can make. Uh, if you're gonna, if you're gonna say you're gonna be a producer, go into production like you said you're gonna do, uh, and uh, 
and focus less on talking, well, I need an X number of price before I go into production. Uh, make a decision to go in because the people aren't going to go and do contracting for a, a uh, we may, you know, we'll come in when it, we'll start producing when the market's right or certain criteria. Uh, we made a decision because we had, oh, you know, to go into production last year and we've been going full blast doing that. It's just, and uh, because, first of all, we said we were going to go into production, but the other was is that we saw the market moving in the direction and even where today's spot price is, uh, we are we are going to be in, you know it, it's it's above well above our cost of production. So it was an easy decision to make, but also one that uh, having been in this industry, particularly on the operation side, the production side, it became a it was a pretty straightforward uh, decision to make. Uh, and by doing that, making that decision, a commitment, it delivered two additional contracts we signed. And then, uh, you know, potentially another one or two uh, in the near term. Uh, but it provides credibility. And that's what when, the, when these uh, field buyers go to their management and say, hey, these guys want to get a contract with us. They're going to ask, well, will they deliver one? And then two, are they the real thing? And you know, we don't have to go and make a lot of promises because people already know who we are. So, and Bill, this one's definitely this one's definitely for you. So, I've got to ask you again. It's, it's, it's to do with that conversation I had with that, the, the other CEO who has got your own money into production before. He's saying that there's going to be a dawning realization from u, u, utilities and, and funds or bankers uh, alike, where people talking the game of getting into production, who in an, in a cost, you know, a spot price environment, or you know, there, therefore term, term contract environment, where the prices are where those companies said they needed to be and they're still not getting into production. So how important is it for you guys to, one, get into production before you perhaps go out to market and raise capital for more M&A? Because there's a lot of M&A happening in the market. You've just done, done a bit yourself, but there's probably more to come. And in an environment where there's lots of new entrants coming into the space and sort of, you know, tr trying to, you know, with a lot of white noise, trying to, you know, cannibalize uh, any potential investors in your project. So again, how do you, how do you play all of that? Well, I think uh, you go back to where we really started the company, and that was based on 10 years of accumulating a, a real top-notch technical team, and that, of course, was highlighted with Paul coming in as CEO and adding our COO after that. But, uh, you know, we've got probably the deepest bench strength, uh, not only at the board level, but in management, right down to operators in the field. Our first uh, acquisition, if you recall, brought us uh, an established, uh, well-trained uh, field in, or crew in the field operating plants. Uh, that, uh, you know, we're formally in production in Texas and we're being maintained and, and ongoing activity. So it's it's been the fundamental uh, objective and, and execution of the company to build not only a portfolio of properties, but a portfolio of production assets that are permitted. So we aren't starting at the beginning. We aren't having to fund the CapEx. And we're, we're incredibly well staffed to, to execute on this. So it makes, uh, you know, just following on to what Paul said, I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, a, uh, it's a, just a fact of the people that we have that will be able to execute on this. And, and in terms of the properties and the additions here again, in order for, uh, I've been saying for the last year, in order for anything to be added on the M&A front, it's got to be accretive on one of three levels. And, uh, you know, that's either uh, capacity of production or timeline to production or cost of production. And in this instance, uh, we've got all three of those in the same transaction, which is just ideal. And uh, uh, obviously, I think our strongest thing I've always maintained as well as our people and our staff, because as you mentioned, there are an awful lot of companies coming on board. There are an awful lot of companies entering the sector. But uh, realistically, most of them have uh, very little opportunities to produce anything. And uh, sure, you can go and explore for uranium. There's, there's quite a bit of uranium around. That Finding uranium isn't the difficult part. The, the real uh, essence of it is being able to uh, permit it, extract it, monetize it. These are, these are the real shortages of, of talent in the industry. And that we've uh, got, uh, I think it's fair to say, well, more, more than our fair share. So it, it'll enable us to, to execute uh, on our plan. And many of our assets are a bit longer term. So it makes for a very nice pipeline of staged, uh, staged growth. Here's an interesting one. Well, Paul, tell me what you think here. 
we, we've seen in the, the battery space, a lot of the battery manufacturers and the OEMs who five years ago would never countenance investing in a mining company because it's too risky. Now they're trying to secure their supply chain uh, for 2025 and beyond uh, we, with commodities which are running out. So in, in the context of some of the conversations we've had today in terms of the ability for people to get into production, in terms of timelines, et cetera, can you ever see a situation where utilities maybe move upstream a little bit? I, I won't say never or won't. Uh, they did in the past, if you, if you go back into the uh, 70s and 80s, uh, every uranium project had some form of a nuclear utility was a joint venture partner or had a piece of the action to secure that supply. That's back when they thought there was a finite amount of uranium left in the world. And uh, they didn't want to be subject to the Westinghouses out there. So, but fundamentally it's changed uh, because they, on a risk side is because a lot of those joint ventures never panned out. And there's a, a long memory at these, uh, at the, the, the board of directors at the uh, at these utilities about how their investment wasn't so great back then. Uh, but I think the way they'll do this is uh, they could look at, uh, as we move along, looking at interesting contracting uh, uh, strategies, including potentially uh, prepaying a portion of the contract amount to provide seed funding for construction and other things and uh, that, uh, uh, could be coming about. We know that some of the trading companies have done that, uh, the larger trading houses. Uh, and uh, But it wouldn't be beyond me to see uh, utilities put in more of an indirect investment into a project uh, to secure that, uh, that, that volume. Right now, there's no, you know, with prices uh, uh, kind of in the 50s, and now even though we talk about the 50s, it's just a, it's like some kind of like the new norm. When a year ago it was in the 30s, so I'm, you know, we got it's kind of amazing what we think is our norm now, and uh, but when prices really start moving up again, and it looks like there's going to be constraints on supply, I, I would it wouldn't shock me for some of the more prudent nuclear operators to look at finding ways to to lock in and and actually uh, pr uh, support new production. Uh, the uh, with banking, but you know, in the past, what they would do is do uh, bankable contracts, uh, so that you could take it to a bank and get a loan, you know, use it against a loan. And uh, now, with mortgage rates, you know, interest rates moving up and all that, uh, that may be less of a uh, an incentive for a producer to go do a loan. And uh, and having maybe a different type of investment vehicle, uh, the utility might be, you know, would be looking at that. Uh, I think some of the more innovative ones are, are, are looking at these different alternatives, but I don't think they're ready to pull a trigger on them yet. Right. And, and, and Bill, a question for you with regards to, again, so market moves. You saw Cameco obviously looking to try and, well, potentially uh, try to start building more integrated um, business with a recent acquisition. And, it, and we, we forget uranium is a very small small sector within a very small sector, which is, which, which is mining. Um, can you see more big moves like that rather than just pure play, um, you know, asset acquisition and, and M&A activity? You know, it's interesting their move towards vertical integration is, you know, not the first we've seen in this industry over the years. Um, and, you know, a company of their size, certainly I can see wanting to branch out. And it's an endorsement, I think, of uh, the nuclear power's future in, in the whole energy cycle, uh, which is very good. Uh, but here again, you know, we, we're nowhere near their size. Uh, we know what we're good at. We know where we're good at it. And uh, we're in the midst of the world's largest consumer of nuclear power, i.e. uranium, that produces essentially zero until uh, we get some of these plants back online. So I think we know where our sweet spot is. Uh, you know, if you look at our growth potential, uh, five, six years out, we'll be going at five million pounds a year clip. And uh, here again, from non-invasive in situ means, uh, only thing we're looking at is in situ. And, uh, you know, we will continue to, uh, you know, add economies of scale when we can at, at the right opportune moments. Uh, but here again, they have to be accretive because we've got a pretty, uh, pretty robust pipeline of projects now. And uh, executing on that will be, uh, you know, a tremendous value to our shareholders, as well as security of supply in the U.S. So why is, why is that a better strategy than some, you know, there's a, there's a couple of uh, other, other big players in, in the space who are not in production, their expiration predominantly, and may, may, maybe you could you could say that they are at the development stage, maybe, but certainly nowhere near production. 
who have got multi, you know, they're four times your size, right? Um, and maybe that's through acquisition, and maybe that's through the, 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 the great hopium of the future. Um, but do you ever look at things like the companies like that and say, do you know what? Perhaps we need to just adjust our strategy. Perhaps we need to do a little bit less focus on actual production, actual creation of, 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 of wealth, no. selling something. In a word, no. Um, Be sure. You know, I, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty certain on this one. Uh, you know, I've been uh, in and out of uh, various things, including the uranium industry, for you know, going on longer than I'd like to say, 40 years. And uh, while exploration is glamorous and has its day and, and all of that, it's uh, it, quite frankly, it's a non-sustaining business model. In fact, arguably not a business model. Your uh, your road to success as an exploration company is almost always at the mercy of an acquirer valuing what you've what you found. And it's exciting and it's fun, but uh, cash flow is, uh, you know, critical to a company's longevity and and uh, prospering. And uh, that's what this company's been built for. You know, we'll, we'll still be doing a bit of head frame exploration, if you will, or brownfields. You know, here again, we aren't really a mining company as much as we're a water processing company. And, uh, you know, we do it through pumps and pipes, not, not through big yellow trucks. And uh, that's part of the environmental uh, edge that we've got. In terms of permitting, cost of uh, production, cost of reclamation, you know, the, the entire uh, aspect. But, um, you know, we, we've got at, at 5 million pounds a year production profile, we've got pushing on 40 years of material in front of us. We will be doing a bit of exploration on the project. Simply take example, our most recent uh, acquisition. Uh, they did a bit of exploration uh, back uh, when Paul was uh, there at the property as a private company. And uh, we're very successful. They identified 52 miles of roll front and were able to really work on about 15% of that and, and develop, uh, you know, double digit billion pound uh, of resource out of it. So you know, we've got 45 miles of uh, roll front identified on this project. It's a huge project, 200,000 acres, private surface, right smack in the middle of the uh, Texas uranium belt, most favorable state to be working in, uh, permit wise, business wise. And uh, you know, it fits right in with our uh, our operation centers already, so it's not another cost center in terms of location. It's uh, it's ideal for us. So, quite frankly, we've we've as I said, we've got more than our fair share of talent at uh, extractive uh, production. It would be um, you know, exploration's great for those that want to do it, and but but we don't see any value in increasing our spread, and we'd have to uh, have a different staff. Uh, we think that. Uh, you know, once this price fruition really comes through and we see the increase in nuclear power and we see the increased reliance on domestic nuclear power, which is really our, our key, uh, I think we're very well set. If I might add, uh, Bill hit on a good point as part of this Alt the, uh, the Alta Mesa acquisition. It's not just a production facility. It's also the, the, there's a lot of uh, uh, upside there. Uh, the, the, you can't just rely on the technical report to be the, the, the means for determining what the asset is. Uh, I get, we get a lot of questions about why the, there's a high number of inferred resources. That's because we stopped drilling before we could start converting. But also, uh, it's quite open-ended. There's, uh, Bill talked about one trend of 52 miles. That's just one of six uh, uranium targets we have that have been identified in the technical report that need to be drilled out more. And the only reason the drilling stopped back in 2008 is because the uranium price dropped and, and the company was a private company relying on cash flow to be able to support that exploration program. And obviously when you don't have cash, you cut back where, where you can. But I, I, I've got, I've been, I know enough, of, I've been associated with this project twice before my career, once with the original private owner, Ms. Stanley Uranium, and then secondly with Energy Fuels. And I still believe that, uh, the, the value of this property has not been fully tapped yet. There's a lot of upside to it. And uh, it brings a, not only capacity to us, but in near-term production, but I believe in South Texas, it really puts us in the cornerstone of, uh, of production capacity and long-term uh, long -term life of uh, uh, uranium assets in, in the area, just simply because of the scale but also the fact that uh, there's, I believe there's quite a bit more of value to be unlocked. Okay, so, we, so we've got, we've got near-term near cash producer at scale with a lot of blue sky upside. Yeah. Bill, it's, it, it, it feels like um, you've got a job to talk to retail and say, 
this is a much more attractive proposition than maybe some of the things, some of the slightly noisier neighbors that you have? Well, I, I think, you know, clearly a uh, broader, broader market awareness, uh, execution on the plan, uh, moving into a, uh, you know, a, a more senior exchange is, is obviously uh, some priorities for us. And, you know, I, I hate to say it, but if you go back to, if you build it, they will come. I mean, we have a, a serious need for our product and the ability to, to get it. So it's, uh, that's where our efforts have been really is, is on acquiring it, building it, and getting it into production. And you know, I think 2023 is going to be a, a dynamic year for us. And uh, each year after that should follow on uh, with, with even better results.